Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper. Well, here it is, after Labor Day, we're not supposed to be wearing those patent leather shoes, those white buck shoes or white pants, but you know what? When it's up in the 90s and blazing hot, I'm going to wear whatever I've got that's cool. And fortunately, it's cool here tonight in the studios in Sumter. I'm Amanda McNaughty with Clips and Extension, and I'm so glad you could join us for an hour of gardening advice coming to you from SCE TV's Making It Grow. And we are coming to you from historic downtown Sumter. Teresa Lott is in the chat room, and she would love to have you join us. As soon as we go inside, she'll tell you how easy it is to do that little business on the Internet, and you'll be right in there chatting away with her and all of her friends. We took a grand trip a little while back. We went up to Spartanburg. Spartanburg Community College has one of the finest horticultural programs available, and they do wonderful projects with their students, and they did a grand project on the new downtown campus. You can enjoy seeing that and how it went. Of course, we'll have a visit from Dr. John, the mystery doctor with the mystery plant, and we have a special guest tonight. Rebecca Helmuth is an agronomy agent, and she's going to tell us about a big South Carolina crop that everybody likes, peanuts. And we've got two mighty smart people here to answer your gardening questions. So let's go inside and start Start doing that right now. Teresa Lott, who is a water quality um, agent over in Florence, and what exactly is your title? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Sometimes I'm not sure. It used to be natural resources agent before we had a water team, but now I'm a water resources agent. Okay, from natural resources to water resources. And um, at any rate, we're glad that you're with us tonight. And you know, I've seen a lot of We've been getting some scattered showers. We still need some water. It's been hot. But I've seen the sprinklers going on when the water's coming down, Teresa. Surely there's something that you can do to prevent that from happening. There sure is. You know, that is one of my biggest pet peeves is to have had a rainstorm during the evening. I'm out walking the dogs in the morning, and there's the sprinkler on. And I think about all of that water that's going into the storm drains and ditches and carrying all the yucky stuff that gets left on the ground straight to our waterways. But technology can really help you out. You can get an automatic rain shutoff device. If you have a sprinkler system, you put that on there. It's a little sensor that can detect a certain amount of rainfall. They're usually adjustable, so you can set it to match match your needs in your landscape, and then it will override that automatic setting so we'll prevent overwatering. If you'd like more information about creating a WaterWise yard, you can check the Carolina Clear website and also the Carolina Yards website. Lots of great information on both of those places. I hope that you will consider joining me in the chat room. We can talk about WaterWise landscaping if you like. Go to the Making It Grow Facebook page, click on the green Let's Talk icon. It's now on the left side. Once you do, you'll be directed to the chat room. Click to join in the discussion. We are uh, having a slow start. It looks like we've got six speakers, two viewers, so there's plenty of room and time for you to join, and we should be chatting momentarily. Amanda, back to you. Thank you, Teresa, and we are so happy that Tony Melton brought one of his good friends from Florence, Tommy Taylor. And Tommy, what's the name of your business over there? Taylor Garden Gift Shop. 
Taylor yeah. Gardening Gift Shop, and I think your daughter appeared with us once. I think she did a big Christmas program. She did, Amy Taylor Wells, and she loves being with you, Amanda. She's just a cut up, just like you are. Well, excuse me, I think your daughter got hers <laughs> from you. <laughs> well, you don't even like that, huh? <laughs> so, if you garden for life, you can put away strife. Now, your time spent in gardening can ease your arteries hardening. So, why not make a plan to beautify your land? Woo! Woo! Oh, that was first class. I feel like I got Saturday Night Live right My here. My kids call me TNT Cool Pops, and they laugh and make fun of me sometimes. Well, we're not going to make fun of you tonight. We are thrilled that you came to share your many years of gardening knowledge with us, and thanks for making the trip. Thank you for having me. Okay, and of course, Tony Melton is, is just always a red letter day when Tony comes over. Tony helps people all over the PD and beyond with small fruits and vegetables. And, um, you know, Tony, it's right now it's so hot, but I had to plant some turnips, and they did come up, but is it okay to go and do I felt like I just needed to get them in the ground. It's getting that time, Amanda. It's getting kind of pushing everybody to mm -hmm. get them out. And the problem is, if you don't give them enough water, they kind of just oh. germinate, and then they dry up. I see. So you have to keep them watered, keep them damp. Be consistent. To get them up, and then they if they get up, a little bit of size on them. They can stand the heat, man. Okay, so just be real careful during those early days. That's right. I will. And so you think we're, that our farmers know what they're doing, and we're going to have some of those wonderful crops. Oh, this sure. There's some pretty ones out there, okay. man. Okay, so well, no shortage of turnips and collards. No shortage. Not, that's wonderful news. And another thing that's happened is that we have a lot of new wonderful agents with Clemson, and Rebecca Hell with this one. She is an agronomy agent down in Dorchester and Berkeley. And Rebecca, I think you're going to give us some news on an old crop. I am. Peanuts is one of the big crops in South Carolina, and I went out to the field today to get some samples, and I'll be talking about us getting ready to dig in South Carolina. Hot dog, and um, it's fun. Uh, Rebecca's going to tell us some pretty cool facts. I bet there's a lot about peanuts that you will now you will know at the end of the show that you did not know at the beginning of the show. And of course, Dr. John Nelson is going to come on and hope that we will learn something at the end of the show that we didn't know when he brought his mystery plant to us. Dr. John, how are you doing up there tonight? Well, we are um, having a pretty huge storm right now. So Whoa! I hope the power doesn't go out or anything. Well, I hope not, um, but, too. <laughs> but otherwise, all is well. Good. Are the puppies bothered by the thunder, or are they pretty relaxed? Well, I think Hannah's pretty relaxed over there, and Rosie's sort of invisible on this chair. Okay. On this oh, Hannah's snoozing away, oblivious to what's going on outside. Um, well, John, a <laughs> lot of people are, are, are not oblivious, but are in the dark about what's in their yard or things that they see on hikes, and if they want to get an identification for a plant, what's the best way to do that? <clears throat> well, it's real easy. Um, all one has to do is uh, send me an email, and um, uh, frequently people will send me uh, a photograph attached to an email, and that's usually a really good way to see what you've got. Um, otherwise, give me a call. Um, I'll answer the phone. And um, sometimes you got to leave a message, though. And I will get in. We'll figure out some way to get the plant that you have if you don't want to send it by uh, email. Okay. And John, thank you. This is a free service that you provide. That your wonderful AC Moore Herbarium at the University of South Carolina provides for South Carolina citizens. And um, I know as a Clemson Extension aide, I take advantage of that often. And um, you are very nice about um, identifying things on our Facebook page too. You are a nice partner for us, and we're glad to have you as part of our team. Well, gosh, Amanda, those are such nice words, and um, and I'm awfully happy to be part of the team. All right, we're going to see you a little bit later. We And we, may, right. ch we may change our mind, because if it's a real hard mystery plant, then we're going <laughs> to... be easy. Okay, okay. okay. It'll be an easy one. Okay. We have our first caller tonight. Cheryl's calling us from Piedmont. Cheryl, we're glad to talk to you, and how can we help you? Okay, Amanda, thank you for taking my call. Yes. Um, we've got a pecan tree in our yard. Um, last year, we it had no nuts on it, mm -hmm. but this year we had a good many, but um, they are molding, and now all of them are falling off the tree, and we just <sighs> wondered what was going on with the tree, and um, we we'll appreciate your answer. Okay. Um, you know, it used to be that we could, when we first moved into our little house in St. Matthews, we could pay the taxes by picking up the pecans. But, right. um, but, but of, and I think a lot, a lot of people, but Tony, the peak has gotten real hard because of disease breakthroughs from resistant varieties. Tell us what's been going on with pecans. A lot of people grew the old paper shell, which yeah. is a sly variety, uh -huh. 
which is spelled a little different, S C H L E Y. So it's spelled Sh a little different. Yeah, Shelly, but Schley. Schley. Yeah, yeah. And it is a paper shell, and it is very, very susceptible to scale. And that's what this yeah. black fuzz mold is. That's uh -huh. right. In the the whole of the pecan will turn black and kind of stick to the pecan. Mm -hmm. Then on the inside of it, it degrades, and when you later on when you pick them up, they don't have anything in them. And a homeowner's just kind of up the creek because you can't spray a pecan tree. That's right. It's it's they're just too big. Uh, they spray them a lot in orchards, actually. They do. Yeah, because most of the time they grow a variety called desirable mm -hmm. that it has actually no resistance to scab, but it's heavy producer. It just produces great beautiful, yeah. great uh -huh. pecans, okay. and they grow it, but they have to spray it all the time. And it's sly, and Stewart's even breaking this resistance. the resistance. Yeah. yeah. So sadly. Um, the days of pecans. Now I've heard the Elliot has a little bit of resistance. Elliot and Sumner uh -huh. has has real good. That's the ones people should so be going for. So if you want for. to, um, you know, if you want to plant some pecans for the future, I would encourage you to do that. But again, um, when we planted these varieties, Tony's talking about back then, they had some resistance, but it changes over time. Changes anyway. But thank goodness there are a lot of people who have um, who are growing pecans in South Carolina, so you can be sure that you can get enough to make cookies and fruit cake and all those wonderful things. Um, we've got Anita calling us from Simpsonville up there. Um, Anita, has it been hot up there like it is down here in the Midlands? It has, but I've enjoyed it because I know summer's almost over. <laughs> well, I'm, I hope that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I'm, so. I'm ready for some fall. Well, what's happening up there in Simpsonville that we can help you with tonight? Well, I want to know if you can get a disease or would damage your health to eat tomatoes that birds have penetrated. You know, I mean, just not just a little nibble, but deep okay. into the tomato. Right. Some of my prettiest ones the birds like them too. Well, I have a good sharp knife in my kitchen and I felt pretty safe. What do you think, Tommy? That's what I do. I just do a little surgery on that tomato, get rid of that damaged material, and go ahead and enjoy it with some mayonnaise and two slices of bread and wow. There you go. <laughs> some good and yeah, that's good. That's good <laughs> and Tony, you're our expert in that. Would you concur that that Yes. Uh, I mean, unless the tomato's uh, rotted or something. Yeah, yeah, you don't want any rot on a tomato because, yeah. uh, especially, and, and, you know, there is diseases on birds, bird flu, is, but mm -hmm. they're not the bird flu we hear all about. There are other uh -huh. bird flus, which is not as bad and all. But usually you don't have any problem with that. As long as you cut that area out and get that away, it doesn't affect the tomato. It's just you just don't want any of the, the bird droppings yeah. and stuff on yeah. there. So okay. get rid okay. of those for okay. sure. All right. Um, well, and I, actually sometimes, you know, you're lucky to have a tomato and you just have to share because it's gotten harder to grow tomatoes. We've got a call from North Carolina. Rebecca lives in Harris, and we're glad to hear from you tonight, Rebecca. Um, what's happening up there that we can help you with? Oh, it's still hot up here, too. I think it's hot everywhere. Uh, I have a question about Irish plants. Uh-huh. Uh, -huh. uh when is the correct time to cut them back? How is it late, later, or they look so bad right uh, now? These and I are don't your, want to touch them. These are your bearded iris. Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay. Well, Tony, you know I usually. Although they look bad, if they're still green, I feel like they're still photosynthesizing. What's your thought on that? I think so, too. I've left mine, and mine's sitting there. And they're still putting energy back down into that rhizome, and it's going to come back up better and stronger if you leave it on there as mm -hmm. long as you possibly can. And you've got something to say. Is this going to be a rhyme or just well, a no, straightforward Well, no, no, this is straightforward. Segment? You could okay. actually tip prune them like uh -huh. you do your house plants. Oh. You could cut the dead off, the All tips, right. yeah. with a sharp pruner. Good. Or yeah. a pair of scissors. Okay. That's a wonderful idea. Just save the green. Uh -huh. So if it's offending you by not being pretty, yeah. boy, that was a simple and smart answer. Thank you for making the trip over. I'm glad that you're with you're us welcome. tonight. Okay. Um, well, we're going to have a treat. We're going to talk to Dr. John Nelson early tonight, just in case that storm interrupts the power. Um, Dr. John, tell us about this week's mystery plant. Okay. Um, we have a real e an easy one tonight. Everybody's going to know what it is. <clears throat> but maybe not until we get to the very final image. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the reason that I want to deal with this one is I want to talk about this plant's flowers. Most people don't ever see the flowers or don't pay much attention to uh -huh. them. They only see the, the, the leaves of this plant. I see. But the flowers are produced uh, on a stalk 
-hmm. They're very, very tiny. They're male flowers and female flowers wrapped up in a sort of a yellowish um, brat. And you hardly ever see the flowers at all on this guy until you uh, cut that thing open if you mm -hmm. want to. And now the, the female flowers are the ones down at the bottom of the spike, and they're sort of green. Yes. And then the male flowers are up on the top of it, and they're sort of yellow. Oh, because of the pollen. Uh, well, it is in, uh, pollinated by insects. My so goodness. insects go in there and crawl around and have a lot of fun and move pollen around. Um, it's interesting, when I was up, this was actually on campus this morning, where I found these plants, and I was like whacking away on them. I hope I didn't wasn't going to get in trouble. But um, I kept smelling a gardenia bush, Ooh. and it was wonderful to have a gardenia bush blooming. Uh -huh. But there wasn't any gardenia bush, and in fact, it was this thing. Come on. And oh yeah, and it was a uh, um, just it was kind of a surprise, but maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise. But anyway, the reason that most people know this plant is because it produces um, fabulous, gigantic foliage. Oh. And um, <laughs> when we get around to be seeing this picture, you'll see um, a young student that I, I asked to have her picture taken so you can all see the uh, size of this monstrous leaves that this plant makes. All right. And I think everybody knows what it is. I'm beginning it's to get an idea. <laughs> Whoa. And there, there is Ashley standing uh, next to this plant at the Russell House. And well, bless her heart for helping out. A lovely co-ed and a lovely <laughs> elephant. Yeah, yeah, that is so much fun. And you could actually <laughs> smell the fragrance. Well, I could. And, um, you know, my, my ears are going bad, but my nose is not. <laughs> and uh, it seemed to be... Um, you know, putting out plenty of fragrance, and it was uh, quite nice. It was very, very uh, fragrant. Well, and um, that's a plant that's always happy when we get some rain, some rain because they do need a lot of rain to keep those big, beautiful leaves. Mm -hmm. And um, and tell, please tell um, your friend that we sure are glad that she was willing to yeah. pose. It makes the prettier picture much prettier, John. Good old Ashley. I hope she'll get back in touch with you. I hope she will too, John. <laughs> thank you so much, and we'll look forward to visiting with you next week. All right, we'll have fun then too. All righty. And right now we're going to check it with Teresa and hear about the activity that's going on in the chat room. Teresa? Thanks, Amanda. Well, we have 10 people in the chat room, so it's a little slow tonight. Nine speakers, one viewer. I did just get a message that the station is gone, so someone is not able to watch on the television screen, but apparently their internet is still working because we are still chatting away. And, you know, Making It Grow does stream live, so you could always watch the show by going to the Making It Grow uh, website and watching from your computer if your cable or satellite happens to go out. We're here to answer your gardening questions. Um, our recent one is about a pest, but I'm still waiting for a little bit more description. Right now, all I know is it's yellow and fuzzy. So uh, hopefully we'll get a little more descriptions and we can figure out what might be that person's pest and if uh, any control needs to be taken. Amanda, back to you. It, um, it could be a chicken. They're yellow and fuzzy, a bitty. <laughs> and at times, my family's considered me a pest, and I'm kind of yellow and fuzzy, too. <laughs> um, I hope I'm not a pest on the Internet tonight. Um, Joy's calling us from Easley. Hello, Joy. How can we help you tonight? Hey, Amanda. How are you? I'm good. I hope you are, too. I'm doing great. Wonderful. I wanted to find out probably the impossible. Oh. Uh, is there such a thing as a non-invasive Mimosa tree. A non-invasive mimosa tree. Mm, mm, mm. Tony, we worry about those pests, those non-native invasive exotic pests. And um, in certain parts of the state, it is really a plague. Tell me what you know about the mimosa. As far as I know, Amanda, I don't know of one that is is non-invasive. They all produce those seeds and those flowers and and they're spread all over the place and they come up and they take over. They are short lived though. Mm -hmm. um, there's a blight or something that comes through <coughs> periodically. Tommy, I know for a while there was like some black or dark stemmed mimosas or something, weren't there? Weren't there some cultivars that there's were There's some different? cultivars out, but I don't know any of them in the trade right now mm -hmm. that I've seen. Yeah. And I like the tree when it's in bloom. 
Beautiful. And, and some, you know, just, you've got the right space for it. Mm -hmm. But like Tony said, a little bit of wind and air everywhere. And we can't control that. So I think the best thing <coughs> is to try to find a native plant that will give you beauty. And we appreciate so much that you're, you're um, taking, you know, taking the interest to um, bring that up because um, we do sometimes something so pretty we want to have it, but um, it's just like some of the things that we should, you know, we, we, we know we shouldn't eat. A sterile um, variety would be nice if somebody would develop one. It would be nice would yeah, if somebody yeah. would come up yeah. with one. As far as we know, that has not yet happened. Um, we're hearing from Z. What a fun name. Z's calling us from Fountain Inn. Hey, Z, how are you? I'm all right, Amanda. How are you? I'm good. Listen, I would like to ask you a question, please, ma'am. Go I'd ahead. I'd like to know when can I plant creases, watercress. Uh-huh. Well, I always called them creases back in the old days. All right. Watercress. W-A-T-E-R, Chris, C-R-E-S-S. -S. Okay. Where can um, I plant them? Um, Tony, tell me about this crease. This crease. Well, we call it creasy greens creasy a lot greens, of times. Creasy greens, yeah. And actually, they do can them. I think we got a can time. of them up there somewhere, yeah. to tell you the truth. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're in the same group the as swine are, yeah. cress, and, uh -huh. and which grow good in the wintertime. Uh -huh. They're this plant now. Then okay. they'll start coming up and they'll grow through the winter. Uh, Swinecrest is a weed uh -huh. that actually is all over South Carolina. I see it all the time, and it's, it's in the same group as that. And actually, it grows rather well in the cool South Carolina. Do you Carolina. think you'd need to go to one of the heirloom plant supply catalogs to get the seeds, perhaps? Yes, probably so, because I don't... I mean, you can buy them. You, you um, see them around sometimes? We do. Yeah. Uh, you know, there is some okay. planting on, okay. on a commercial basis of okay. Chrissy Green. How much water especially. do they need? Uh, they pretty tough along the sides okay. of swine crests and okay. all. They're pretty tough, and but the more water you give them, the more they'll grow, the better they'll be, okay. and the tender right. they are, man. Well, Adam, I hope that you'll find some this one and bring some in because I've never had any. Okay. So you, you put that on your on your list of things to look for. for all right. Me. Okay. Okay. John's calling us from York, where Paul Thompson, our dear friend, lives. And John, we're glad to talk to you tonight. How can we help you? Well, I got a plant that I don't know recognize, and I watch y'all shows all the time. So I got a question about it. It, it puts on uh, flowers. Uh, it's pink and red, or uh, white and red, or purple and uh, white, or whatever. And, uh, and it's got big old balls on it, big old uh, 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 blooms on it, and like like little balls about as big as your thumb. And I was kind of wondering what kind of plant that thing is. First, I was can I trim it? <laughs> well, you know what, John? You're going to have to get a camera. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or find a young person with a telephone and take a picture of it because you, I, I, I mean, I, that's. There's no way. There's no way I can do it. Right over my head. Yeah. I didn't get it. But you sure got me interested now, and I'm not going to be able to relax until I find out what it is. So get yourself a picture and send it in. And um, if you, you can either email it to me at Clemson or you can put it on our Facebook page. But take a picture and send, send, take several pictures, and we would love to learn what this fascinating plant is. And thank you for calling us. Okay. Um, I think you've got some wonderful things that we can identify oh, yeah. that are right in front of the set. So let's start with this fern-like little creature to my that's right, down here. It's, a neat, it's called Soft Caress Mahonia. Soft Caress Mahonia. Now, Mahonia has been around a long time. And there's nothing soft about the old ones that our grandma had. Grandma planted had. those sticky things to keep the kids away from the rest of the plants. Yeah. But this one grows about three to three and a half feet. Mm -hmm. Good size. And it looks a lot like a fern. Mm -hmm. How about um, exposure? Well, it just goes down to minus 20. And how about the sun? Fahrenheit. Uh -huh. And then it's just best in part shade part to full shade. shade. Uh -huh. so, okay. And it gets those yellow flowers and blue uh -huh. fruit in yeah. late, uh, which, late which winter. Which the bees love when they yeah. come out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've seen it used in some kind of large areas that were shady. And it's very beautiful as a, as a drift, don't you You can think? use it almost as a ground cover, okay. yes, exactly. Mass planting, we yeah. like to see. And then next to it, we've got <clears> a fun, good-looking plant. Isn't that neat? That's a little lime, or it's a limelight uh, hydrangea. Uh-huh. And it's one of the paniculatas, or PGs, which does well in full sun. And fortunately blooms in the summer when nothing else is going on. What a, bo what a bonus that is Isn't for us. God gives us so many things to enjoy in the garden. That's true. And this is one of my very favorite plants. Matter of fact, I love hydrangeas, period. And, and this, this one, um, I've had best luck because I like to cut them for the, for the flowers. Mm -hmm. I usually cut mine back um, almost to the last year's growth each year. And um, in the 
you know, in February. So to get right. that those nice long stems for cutting the next year, is that a practice that you think is okay to go? As use? long as you don't cut the cane all the way back. No, I don't do, do that. It has yeah. to produce on last year's wood, yeah. so uh -huh. you need to make sure you leave some of that cane okay. for next year's growth and okay. flowers. Beautiful. And then next to that, we have something that I don't know what it's doing blooming this time of year. <laughs> that's the azalea that knows no season. Uh -huh. The encore, that particular one is called, it's called Autumn Rouge. Beautiful color. I've got them five feet tall in my garden. Oh, how gorgeous. All behind my Tuscan garden. And how garden. many times have you got flowers on? Spring, summer, and fall. Phew. Isn't that amazing? That's a bonus. You I mean, that's an encore. Yeah. Take a nap. Yeah. Take a Plant breeders are phenomenal yeah. people, and they make it so easy for us. And even an old, tough plant like Liriope, and you've got some of the evergreen, some of the larger ones here. Tell yeah. me about these two that you've got up We've here. We've got two on my right is uh -huh. the old, common, evergreen giant Liriope, which a lot of people use. I've planted a lot of them. Uh-huh. And into the, right beside it is a new one called Green Goddess, which is more adapted to wetter conditions. We've had a lot of problems with the evergreen giant dying from too much water uh -huh. or too much mulch. Oh. Oh, this uh -huh. green goddess seems to be more resistant to that and thrives in the garden. And, you know, it gets to be a good size. I've got one um, right where when my children were learning to drive, if they backed the car over it, it wouldn't hurt it. Resilient. And, That's good. Yeah, and, and then they would know they hit something, but it wouldn't damage the bumper. So remember, those evergreen giant or the green goddess, and it's a great place. And it flowers nicer this time of year, too, yeah, so that's a bonus. pretty little flowers, too. Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we have Bob calling us from Aiken, um, where our friend Suzanne Holmes lives, and um, used to come. We hope she'll come back soon and be on the show with us. Um, Bob, how can we help you tonight? Um, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not sure I, I know exactly the grass. It's, don't most people around here call it Bahalia grass? It's, it's Bahalia grass. One. Oh, Bahalia grass, yeah, <laughs> the highway grass. Uh huh. Yes, ma'am, with the black head, the seed pods. Yeah. Peace. <laughs> You cut it and three or four days later, those stalks are sticking up in the yard. They sure are. That's right. <laughs> How can we I'm, help you? All righty. Uh, I've got some centipede mixed in with it. Mm -hmm. And and I saw something that was on y'all's show uh, about the pH for, like, centipede versus bahia grass. And can, by changing the pH, can... Can you get the centipede to grow? <laughs> um, I'm going to turn. The, I'm going to turn this over to Tony Bob. Um, the hay grass is is tough, and it's that's good. Tough. It's going to take anything you throw at it and keep on going, Amanda. It's going to overcome the centipede. You know, my favorite way of controlling it for homeowners and all is I'll take me something like a paint roller, mm -hmm. which I use as a wick and put a little bit of round. Uh, a glyphosate, glyphosate, yeah, glyphosate on it and just walk around and swing it and just touch the seed heads and really? just put enough on the seed heads and then you have to wait about 10 days to before two weeks you before you cut the grass but it'll go down and kill the whole plant really so just you don't want to have it dripping because you don't want it to drip, <coughs> on, the drip on your and if it'll hit that seed head It'll carry it down to the root. It'll carry okay. it down to the root and take care of it, and then it's gone after a while. Well, there you go. There's a good practical solution. Trust Tony Milton <laughs> to have a to do that. <laughs> um, thank you, Tony. Um, I'm real excited about learning about practical practicality uh, and harvesting peanuts, and I'm going to go meet our new first-time guest. But while I make my way over there, we're going to check in with Teresa and her chatters. Teresa. Thank you, Amanda. We have a great night going on in the chat room, as always, some of our regulars, and we even have a new person joining us from the great state of Georgia. One of our regular Facebook fans sent in a really neat photograph of two caterpillars in her yard this week, and thanks to Vicki Bertinale for identifying these guys, or they could be gals, I'm not sure. They do happen to be the same species, even though they look very different. One is smaller and red, and the other one is kind of more of a green base, more multicolored. These are from the banded sphinx moth, probably, and uh, the adults are really cool looking, kind of look like little fighter jets uh, in terms of their shape, although their coloration is much different. So remember that even though caterpillars do damage, right, they feed on foliage, that if you enjoy having butterflies or moths in your yard, that we have to tolerate a little bit of that damage in order to have the enjoyment later on. Let's check in with Amanda and her guest at the side counter. 
Rebecca Helmuth makes the trip up from St. George to join us tonight, where she's an agronomy agent in Dorchester and Berkeley. And obviously, we're going to talk about <laughs> peanuts. And is this a big crop for our South Carolina growers? Yes, definitely. Um, the four biggest crops are corn, cotton, peanuts, and soybeans. And so this is one of the ones that I deal with the most. And you say there are two varieties that are most commonly grown here. And what are they? Right. Um, the larger ones here are the Virginia type, and then the smaller ones are the runner type. Okay. And are they used for different purposes? Uh-huh. Yeah. The Virginia peanuts are the ballpark salted peanuts that would stay in the shell. Oh, because they're bigger and you can mm -hmm. e open them easier. Yeah. Okay. And then the runner peanuts are used for peanut butter, candies, salted peanuts that you would buy out of the shell. Um, a a place for both of them because yeah. we need both of those, don't we? <laughs> Definitely. And um, what are some of the varieties that we grow? The most common for the Virginia are Baileys, Suggs, and Champs, yes. and those have differing um, maturity dates. Oh, so, so a farmer can decide what fits into his schedule. Yes, best. definitely. Cool. And then for the runners, we have Georgia 06s and Florida 07. Those are the most common in South Carolina. Oh, goodness. That sounds like some kind of research name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the land-grant universities actually do the most research for peanut breeding, and so they develop the new breeds that come oh. out. And we, um, in South Carolina, we have the peanut checkoff. Mm -hmm. And so for each ton that the grower sells, a percentage of their sales goes back into research and advertising. Okay, so they can develop, work on peanuts that have disease resistance mm -hmm. and things like that because there's, just as we were talking about the pecans, yes, you definitely. can't just have one variety forever, can Yes, you? so in South Carolina we have problems with early and late leaf spot and tomato spotted wilt virus. Oh, and, la, 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 yeah. la, 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 <laughs> Well, the peanut is a fascinating plant and you've got a whole plant here and tell us a little bit about how it's put together and what happens when it grows. Right, well the vine is very large, it grows about this wide Ooh. maybe, uh -huh. and then um, um, this plant is mature, but it would have a flower earlier in the season, and then once that is fertilized, it comes down and makes a peg, which is Which this, is just that strand, that Yep, it's strand. like a connector down uh -huh. to the um, nut, and then the nuts develop underground. So they don't grow on the roots of the plant, they grow on no, flowers they don't. that go down and touch the soil. Yes. That is amazing. Yep. And, and you call, what do you call that string? The the peg. The peg, mm -hmm. okay. And we'll say they're pegging. They're pegging. <laughs> yeah. So your peanuts peg, how about yep. that? If you're lucky, they will. But then you said the roots of a peanut have their own special properties also. They do. So the peanut is a legume, just like cow peas and other uh, and plants what does like that. That means that, that means that they can fix nitrogen out oh, of the air. So okay. you don't have to fertilize them with okay. nitrogen fertilizer. Okay. And we can see the little nodules on the roots. Okay. That's, so those little rough spots, little tiny uh -huh. bumps and yep. all. That's like the colony of bacteria that's yep. working with mm -hmm. the peanut itself. Yes. Isn't that fascinating? Well, um, I can tell when my tomatoes need to be picked, <laughs> and sometimes I get my cucumbers before they get too big, but how do you know when to pick your peanuts? Well, what we do is um, I'll go out into the field and pick a couple of the vines, um, pull them up, and mm -hmm. then we pick the nuts off that look like this tan color. All the nuts mm -hmm. off that vine, okay. Yep, and so we'll have something that looks kind of like this. So this is what they look like just straight off straight the Straight off the peel, okay. Uh -huh. And then I'll pressure wash those to take the outer layer of the hull off. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Um, it makes kind of a variety of colors like this. So this is what it, so under this brown skin yep. is another co is layer another of color, color. Another uh -huh. level, layer of skin. Yep. And it could be this very, it's can this varied. But yes. what do the different colors in here represent, Rebecca? The lighter colors are less mature, and then as they get more mature, they're the darker colors, and they can be very black. Okay. Um, now, why is it important to to know when to dig. So if it's too late and there's too many mature nuts, then the peg will actually deteriorate. Oh. And so then when we dig them, those nuts will be left in the soil. Oh, they don't get you don't want up. that. Oh, right. so you lose a lot of your crop. Yes. So what do we look for? What's what kind of So after I have the pressure wash mixed like this, mm -hmm. I would divide it out by color. So we have white, yes, orange, brown, and then a couple of the blacks. Yes. And then if this were a grower, I would count all of these and calculate the percentages for each the group. Percentage? Oh, <laughs> yes. I'm glad I'm not an agronomy agent. <laughs> it takes a long time to count them out while they're watching you too. 
And so what we look for for Virginia peanuts is 30% white uh -huh. and about 70% of the other okay. colors. So does this look about like that kind of distribution? Yeah, these will be about ready to dig. Cool. Now I think you've got some pictures of how they I actually do. get yeah. them out of the field. Uh -huh. I mean out of um, the ground. Yep, I have a couple pictures of um, the tractor that they dig okay. them with. Uh -huh. um, those are being shown. They actually flip the vines over and then oh. the peanuts are up in the air and those take about three to four days to dry out. They want them to dry out a little bit. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yep, and then they come back in and combine them and that's it. <laughs> so the so the green tops and all that organic matter is left and they just walk off with the peanuts. Yep. And then you said some of our farmers now have um, like a GPS system and they because when I look at the peanut fields when I ride to work, you can't I don't even know tell where, where the rows rose are. Yeah. Right. So how, yeah, how does the that vines get so too? big and it's very difficult to see where the rows are, and the digging is the most important part of growing peanuts. And so if they use GPS to plant the nuts, then they can go back and line up exactly where they were so that they have the best yield. That is really something. Well, Tony Melton told us before the show that they used to have to scrape them right. with a knife. <laughs> and that it was just interminable. And so I think now, um, I think all of you agronomy agents have this system. Yes, and much faster. And y'all have been trained. Mm -hmm. And y'all can really make a difference to our farmers in helping them make the best they can out of yep. all the work they put in their peanut crop. <laughs> well, um, I'm real proud that you are taking that research knowledge Thanks. to the field and to the growers. And um, I want you to come back and share some <laughs> tips with us when you learn about another fun crop too. Okay. Okay, thank <laughs> you so much. And now we're gonna go back and see what's happened with Teresa and her chatters. Well, I thought that we'd stick with something edible since we just learned a little a bit about peanuts. And boy, do South Carolinians love their peanuts, especially boiled peanuts. Uh, we had a great photo submitted from Arturo of some persimmons. So generally they fall into two basic categories. You have your native persimmons and then your non-native or orientals. The native ones tend to be smaller, seedier, and more astringent, meaning that if you eat one before it's ripe, you'll get a good pucker on your face. Now, usually I am a fan of native plants, but in this case, perhaps if you're going for yummy, delicious fruit, you might consider going with the, um, the non-native variety. If you'd like to learn more about persimmons or anything else that you're interested in planting and growing, go to Clemson's Home and Garden Information Center, clemson.edu slash H-G-I-C. All kinds of great fact sheets there, including one specifically about persimmons, and then one that we just referred to in the chat room, the Planning a Garden Fact Sheet, which divides our state into three regions and then gives you specific planting dates, spring and fall, for a variety of crops. Great resource. Amanda, back to you. Thank you. And Tony, I know your friend Stan McKenzie has some of those um, non-astringent Japanese persimmons, I think. And are you going to be doing a program with him in the coming up in the next couple of months, or what is a citrus program? Oh yeah, it, what is the the Southeast Citrus Expo comes around every year. Yes. We have it right before Thanksgiving. Okay, so you're going to tell us more about that I'll when it gets get closer. Get all into that information, and we'll make sure that people know about it. I think it's going to be in Georgia this year, okay. though. But, well, I mean, a lot of people go. Yeah. Well, everybody loves that backyard citrus. Joyce is calling us not from Georgia, but from Georgetown. We're happy to hear from you, and how can we help you tonight? I have two the... Uh persimmon trees. I think it's called the Fuji or Fuji. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. They're beautiful trees, but uh -huh. one of them are producing fruit, some fruits, and the other one is not producing anything. One and is and one is not. The one that's not, the one that's getting less sun is not producing, but it's a beautiful tree. The, uh -huh. the one that's getting more sun but not as beautiful is producing fruit, and I'm trying to find out, should I move it or what should I do to uh, help it to bear next year? How big is the is the is the one that's in the shadier area? It's about five feet. It's actually larger than the other one. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. um, well, she's got this plant that obviously needs to get more sun if it's going to be productive with the fruit. Do you think if she did some root pruning, she could move it in the in the spring, or how would you go about trans transplanting it? I don't know how large the plant is, she but said it's it, about five feet. Five feet, okay. So not too terribly large. It's not very large. You could probably move that after frost, maybe. Maybe just go ahead and move it after yeah, frost. Yeah, and then okay. maybe my grandpa used to say, if a fruit tree's not bearing fruit, hit it with a broomstick. Well, that's Shake not research based, so we're not going to do that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, we, move it. but we do know they like sunshine. We've we've they proven do. that with the research, yes, but I have heard that old tale too. You can too. move it. That's right. 
Okay. Um, well, that's so. But and as you said earlier, um, when we were talking about irrigation, um, a tree that's been moved is not established, and it will take extra care. Is that correct? You Indeed, it will, because yeah. you're going to lose a third, up to two thirds of your roots. So she needs to um, pay special attention to it, and not just count on the irrigation system exactly. to keep it going. Okay, great. Um, we always enjoy it when Jay Moore and Kevin Paris come on our show and from Spartanburg Community College, and sometimes we go visit them, and we did that not too long ago and found that they have made a wonderful courtyard at the downtown campus of Spartanburg Community College. is a horticulture instructor at Spartanburg Community College and we're sitting in the interior courtyard at the downtown campus. What do you do when you get a little spot in the middle of a building? You survey the situation and what we were handed was an area that was pretty poorly drained um, but it had a very interesting microclimate attached to it um, so we were able to put some subsurface drains in plant some things a little higher and also put some things that can handle some wet conditions intermittently in here. But it's been a fun, this is probably my favorite place of the downtown campus. Well, I think that we um, see that we can have cultivars that are so different. So the Japanese maples are kind of the, the foundation for this. So let's talk about some of the ones that are here. We were able to bring five different species of Japanese maples or five different cultivars of Japanese maple into this small space. Um, and some of the things that we sort of bent the rules a little bit, oftentimes when you think of a finely dissected leaf, it's oftentimes attached to a form that weeps. And here we have an upright form called Siriu that has a very fine dissected leaf that will give a nice cover in this courtyard eventually. And then on the flip side, we, were, we brought a, species, a cultivar in called Ryusin, which has a broad palmate leaf that is not finely dissected that is a weeping form. So it sort of flip-flops the characteristics of those two that normally go with the other form. I think one of the special things is that you've got really a canvas with the color of the brick, and so you chose some Japanese maples that have some different colors involved in them. Yeah, a lot of what we did in here, when we teach landscape design, we say form, texture, color. And I always say to my students, green is a color, so we've manipulated that green with different shades and different textures of green in here, which I think really works well against the muted color of the brick. It does, and I think one of the things too that I like is the incredibly bright color of some of the hostas. How do they perform in this space? They've done really well in this space. It is, like I said earlier, a little microclimate that um, seems to stay warmer in the winter so some of our hostas remained up and really looking good until December this past year and we had a relatively cold winter so that's really remarkable in my eyes. And when we talk about texture on um, these little upright um, ground cover and, and little grass like um, plants um, add a lot of zing and which ones do you particularly enjoy? I think at the school we're very partial to rhodia just because it is such a tough plant um, and such a broad texture for such a small plant. But then we've got the black mondo, which has done really well in this courtyard, the dwarf mondo, and some of your sedges that really work well in areas that may stay wet over periods of time. Talking about things that are wet, we do have to water. And y'all make a real commitment towards sustainability. What have you done on this campus to try to reduce or minimize water use? Well, it's really a water-wise um, plan as far as irrigation. The majority of this campus is drip irrigation, so we save water that way. We've minimized turf areas so that we don't have a lot of turf. Um, but we've got a smart controller, which has the ability to input a lot of data about the environment, the climate, the type of plant. And it also has a weather station that measures the transpiration, the humidity, the temperature, and helps factor that into when the plants need water and how much water they need based on the data we input into to the controller. So with thought and planning and selection, you have a campus that's probably going to be one of the greenest spots in town and yet have some minimal input. Oh yeah, I think it's really going to be a nice sustainable landscape. We've given the trees plenty of room to grow. We've planted a lot of trees. 
Um, so I think it's a great place in downtown Spartanburg. I've enjoyed learning about the future of horticulture and planting in an urban environment with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Those fellas up there really keep up with the new introductions and they fine tune the selections to do beautifully in each place where they plant them. Um, Tony, um, I did not know, and Tommy, I did not know you were bringing in <laughs> paniculatas, but they hold up so well once they kind of get a little age on them. They do. And so I said it'd be a good hat. And then, thank you, Tony. What's this? You always bring me something messy. They fuss at me, but you bring the mess. What's this yeah, mess? Yeah, that's on Beautyberry. That's one of the prettiest things. And mine just full and laying out with all those berries on it. It's just beautiful. A beautiful native. It is. It sure is. And tough. I'll mm -hmm. say. Very yeah, tough. Yeah. yeah. Just as pretty as it could be. And, um, Teresa, I think you have some information about, um, Spartanburg Community College's horticulture program for us, don't you? I sure do. So if you enjoyed the segment with Jay Moore, you can learn more about what's going on at Spartanburg Community College by following them on Facebook. It's Spartanburg Community College Horticulture, and you'll see lots of great information. They uh, posted where they were going to be sharing the segment today, and uh, an urban tree care class, even a pest control lab. So you can follow what's going on and what the students are learning at Spartanburg Community College in their horticulture program. Before we go back to the panel, we have to show you this picture. I'm sorry it's small, I can't make it any larger, but you'll see that there is a, a young Amanda McNulty and she is pictured there with a candy house at the Richland County Public Library. So you see she's no stranger to the cameras. Uh, she's been in the spotlight since she was young and we're glad to have her here still today. Amanda? Thank you, Anna. The, my mother's friend was the librarian, and they both stood there and said, if you eat any of that candy house, you're going to be in so much trouble, it's not even funny, because I loved sweets back then, and they were afraid I was going to pick off a piece of the roof and pop it in my mouth, but I was good for once, anyway, so, um, whew, anyway, um, we have, um, we have um, Esther calling us from um, Charlotte. Esther, how are you tonight? I'm good, Amanda. I love your show. Thank you for taking my call. Well, we love our viewers. Thank you for being a part of it. We appreciate it. Amanda, I'm calling to learn when is the, uh, a safe time to cut back my, my magnolia tree, and how much can I cut it back? Why do you want to cut it back? Some branches came off during a storm, so one side of the tree is like much longer than the other okay. side and and it's just so out of shape okay all right okay and is this a, a, the southern magnolia the evergreen magnolia that's so beautiful yes okay great okay she's got a magnolia tree that got some damage and she wants to have that beautiful symmetry again so when would you suggest that she try to do a little pruning on it well you can do it at 4 30 i mean <laughs> right away but don't cut it in the middle of the branch, mm -hmm. cut it at a joint, of course, right, Tony? That's right. Always back to another Back branch. to another node or, or a branching mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. And it won't hurt the plant to do that as long as you don't cut it. I don't limb them up, by the way. No, I don't need that. That's the worst the thing you can do to them. Yeah, don't do that. Because you're going to be messing with those leaves yeah, the That's exactly you right. But you can cut it any time. Uh -huh. um, and so, so do you feel like she should wait until it's a little later in the season? If you decorate for Christmas, wait till then That's and trim it for your mantelpiece. That's what I would think because yeah, it does hold right. up so beautifully. Yeah. And it won't be, won't be so many mosquitoes and hopefully it won't be so hot. Exactly. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Pam's calling us from Bennettsville. And Pam, we're happy to hear from you tonight. How can we help you? I have two quick questions, Amanda. All right. The first one is, is it too late to plant lantana out in the yard and is it too late to plant tomatoes in a large pot? Okie dokie. Well, you may have some lantana at the nursery. Um, I would think if you wanted to get it put out now, 
You could plant them. You could plant them. You can. But you're going to water them. That's right, and it's going to probably get killed back uh, by the end of October, maybe mid-November. Just depends on when we get that first harvest. That's right. Yeah, and we could yeah. still, if it's in the ground, most of them think they're a perennial, so they come back. Yeah, they very often do, don't they? But the tomatoes, yeah. what about that, Tony? Would that work <laughs> uh, in, a, in a pot? Well, the only reason I'd do it in a pot now would if I could bring it inside. In a, or put some coasters or under yeah. it. Yeah. Bring yeah. it inside yeah. when it gets cold. There either cover it. Uh-huh. Okay. You know, basically There's a pot. nothing ventured, nothing gained. That's it's right. Not the, it's not the most expensive thing in the world, and if you get a couple of good tomatoes, you'll have such a good time oh, I picking love those a good home homegrown, homegrown tomatoes. tomatoes. Yeah. I know that would be fun. Okay. James is calling us and he lives in Pelion. Thank you for calling us, James. How can we help you with your garden tonight? Yes. I have a carport yes. and around my mobile home, I want to put some weed killer down. So when can I spray that? Um, you've got a carport and you want to put weed killer down? Yeah, underneath the carport yeah, to kill the weeds. Oh, oh, okay. And is there any grass there, or is it just weeds? Yeah, it's grass there, yeah. What kind of grass do you have? Weeds. Excuse me? We, <laughs> what kind of turf grass is that? Or you said there weeds, is... Weeds, that's all it is. Oh, so you want to just kill everything there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to kill everything there, and I want to kill everything around my mobile home. Okay, well, if you want to do that, um, Tony, the only problem, because he wants everything to die, is that some of those herbicides drift when it's hot and you might hurt somebody else. So would you give him some advice, please, on how well, to do this? I would probably just use some glyphosate. Uh-huh. Uh, but it needs to be need, need watered a little bit to get the plants growing better. Uh -huh. Actually, when the plant is growing, it takes it in a lot better. Yes. And it will take it in, and but he's... You know, later on he'll have to apply it again, maybe in a year or so. Uh -huh. But just put some glyphosate. But if it's real hot and you put it out there in the middle of the day, can it drift sometime and do some damage to other plants? Well, most of the time it's 2,4-D that does that. Okay. That if glyphosate usually doesn't drift. It doesn't. Okay. Usually doesn't drift at all very much, and and it washes out of the sprayer real well. So okay. it's really easy to use. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, we are always happy um, to partner up with our other Clemson friends and programs and the Your Day program. Today I heard Dr. Ann, she was telling us all these healthy things to do and I just love to listen to it and on Thursday, September the 4th, um, I'm going to be 64 years old, ha ha ha, um, Dr. Bob, Bob Polemsky who's been on the show and who we all enjoy so much is going to be on and he's going to have Amy Dabbs who you know so well, she's one of our favorite people who comes on so you be sure to tune in on Thursday, September the 4th at noon and hear Bob and Amy and you will have have a very entertaining and educational hour with them on Clemson's own Your Day program. Listen to it whenever you do get a chance. And um, we want to thank Rebecca. She was nervous, she told me, but I thought she just did wonderful. Rebecca Helmer, thank you for coming on. It was a fabulous presentation, and can we get you to come back and see us again? <laughs> Well, I'll have to think about it. <laughs> but if you need more information about commercial peanut production, we have this money maker, peanut money maker production guide. And this is available online at clemson.edu slash extension slash row crops slash peanuts. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a handful. Yes. <laughs> All right, and I'm just going to have to I'm going I'm going to get her mom and daddy's address and call them. Up. I'm going to talk to her regional lead agent and tell them that she's just going to have to come back on because she did a real good job and it was fun to learn all that inter interesting information about our big crop of peanuts. And um, it's always fun when Teresa Salat is over there. She brings us so many nice tips, and she just does such a great job. And um, she really, she and Vicki and Dr. John work on the chat room all the time. Um, Teresa, thank you for all you do um, to make our program um, one that people seem to enjoy. Oh, goodness. It is my pleasure to be a part of Team Making It Grow. We had a good night in the chat room. It started off a little quiet, but we got up to about 22 people in there. So lots of good conversations going on. And... Um, New people, people who are, are regulars, some people who are regulars but have been absent for vacations or other reasons, it's always nice to get together and chat a little bit about gardening successes and gardening problems. Um, don't forget that we do love to answer your questions and see your photos on the Facebook page. You'll especially
definitely want to stop by on Thursday, which is Amanda's birthday, so you can give her your special uh, birthday wishes, and we'll do your best to identify any plants that you submit, although I do have to give Dr. John some major props because I am forever sending pictures to him. Um, just today we sent one of something that happens to be an invasive plant, one of the Ellie Agnes, or we called it Ugly Agnes sometimes. Um, so send those photos, and if we can't help you, we'll send them to Dr. John, who can um, help get them identified. Amanda, back to you. Thank you. Tommy Taylor, tell us how we can find you in Florence. 520 3rd Loop Road, All right. Florence, South Carolina. Okay. On the internet, right. www.gardenforlife. Dot garden dot com. Okay. Or and Taylor at Garden Tommy, for Life. We're com. getting low on time, but Tommy was fussing at me for having uh, pruners that needed. You got to have a sharp garden. I know. And to sharpen your <laughs> garden, <laughs> you need to sharpen. Okay, take the file. Yes, and you, just you work bypass on, pruners. You work okay. it one direction, Amanda. Right. You wear gloves when you do this so you don't cut your fingers. Okay. Okay. And All smile right. while you do it, too. Okay, smile while you do it. <laughs> Garden for Tony, life. thank you so much for coming, and thank, thank you, you for bringing this rapper, uber uh, gardener, and extraordinary you. person. I think Florence, these two, are, this is about all Florence yeah, can take, I tell you that. Can handle but I there. do hope y'all will both come back, because y'all have made it a great and fun show and had so much fun information. Thank you all for joining us, and we will look forward to seeing you again next week right here. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.